Okay, so this is Steve Baer. I'm one of the founders and the managing partner of the game agency. I run creative here and today we're going to be talking about how training is really the hot sauce to engaging learners. And, you know, one of the things we've talked about here a lot is the fact that today, probably more than ever before, uh, learners really need to be engaged. They need to have fun. And right now, this is a really challenging time with the pandemic. So why not turn to games to bring some life and some enjoyment to your training above and beyond what you might do with other modalities? In this talk, we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to really reflect on what the 2020 office and the 2020 classroom looks like today. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to use games to really improve that experience. We're gonna talk about what is the right type of game, um, really, and how to marry that right type of game with your performance objective. We're gonna talk about how to add gamification strategy to your training, and then we're ultimately gonna talk about measurement. Please, if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat and uh, either one of my colleagues will address it or I will. Um, but uh, by all means, let's make this as much a dialogue as possible. So these pictures, hopefully you can relate to them as well as I can. This is what today's office looks like. With the pandemic of 2020, many of us are at our homes. Today is a rare day when I happen to be in my office, but most of us are at our homes and these are what our coworkers look like. You know, our spouses, our kids, our pets, uh, it's hectic, and the reality is, is that from a trainer's perspective, that is even more noise that we have to compete with to make sure that we're truly engaging our learners. We uh, are, are competing with kids, we're competing with mobile devices, we're competing with computers, we're competing with every sound that you could possibly imagine, and how can we as trainers make sure that we are engaging learners on a much deeper level to make sure that we're rising above all that sound. So, you know, a lot of folks are using things like Zoom and Skype, GoToMeeting, Google Hangouts, Microsoft Teams, and many, many more. And the reality is, is that while these platforms are great in bringing people together, one of the challenges is they're not so great at actually engaging learners. So that's where games come in. Games not only connect people, but they also help them remember content. And they're helping them remember content because the content is a lot more engaging. It goes from a very passive experience to a very active experience. So let's talk about that. On the left-hand column here, you see traditional training methodologies, lectures, articles, books, videos, demos, discussions. And to the left of that, you see a level of retention within just a few days or a month after that training. And the reality is it's pretty low. I don't think any of us uh, here or, or in the industry would be satisfied with a 5% retention rate or even up to a 30% retention rate. That's because most of that training is passive training. You're not actually engaging the person. They're not responsible for participating in the content. And as a result, they're not digesting a lot of that content at the level that you want them to in order to remember it. On the right hand side, on the other hand, you have things like games and VR that just require a level of engagement that is way above and beyond what you're seeing over there. Right? You're either uh, putting a controller in your hand or you're glued to a screen or you're glued to a device uh, or you have goggles on your face. And the reality is in all those cases, you are much more immersed in the content and your, your decisions are driving where that content's going. Uh, I'll refer to this a few times during this, this talk, but I, I always go back to the days of my childhood when I used to um, really uh, devour uh, choose your own adventure books. And that's what games are, right? They allow your learners to be in the driver's seat to really define where the content goes and what the user experience is and how things are going to play out in your training content. Um, that's fantastic. So one of the things that I, I often reflect on is the fact that we don't want our learners to fail in the workforce, right? So let them fail in a game first. Let them try, let them fail, let them try again, and hopefully, as a result, let them succeed. They're gonna learn from their mistakes in your games, and in doing so, they're going to be able to really reflect on those until they've mastered the skill, and they can bring that skill with them into everyday life. Let's look at a few examples. 
So Sarah just knocked over $10,000 in inventory. Her mistake to the, co to the company, zero dollars. And why? Because Sarah is playing this in a virtual world. She's able to see what the right techniques are and what the repercussions are when she doesn't do it correctly. Josh, he just contaminated a sample that was critical to a trial and it didn't impact the study. Why? Because he's doing it in a game. We want to think about all these different scenarios, and there are hundreds of them, honestly, that you can build storylines, characters, environments that can allow someone to try something virtually until they successfully master that skill and can apply it in the real world. So one of the things that games are great for is not just a single player experience, but they're great for actually bringing people together, having people collaborate with each other really playing through, uh, building out communities because people are able to enjoy things together, they're able to laugh together, they're able to participate together, and there's really nothing we all need more than that right now, especially in the midst of this pandemic when many of us are working from our individual homes or working remote from one another. So games are fantastic for that as well. I think it's important to look though at where games play in the overall um, environment. Uh, I, I don't think that games can sit as a standalone solution. In my mind, it's really important that you use games as just an ingredient in your overall training. But let's look at how uh, what the benefits are for games uh, versus some of the other modalities and how they might all fit together really well. So I'm starting with instructor-led training. And I always like to look at you know, some of the metrics on the left-hand side. So uh, is this application-based? Uh, what's the cost per learner? Can someone uh, you know, attain proficiency in a particular skill? Uh, will they be confident upon completing it? Uh, will they retain that information? Uh, can they apply the skill post-training in the real world? Uh, are they engaged? And what's the ROI on your cost? So, you know, I, I do believe that classroom training gets a lot of high marks here, moderate to high marks here. But one of the things that's important to think about is not only uh, you know, is, it, is it great for uh, giving them applicable uh, skills and having them do them real time in, in the classroom, and, and as a result, they're gonna get the proficient in it, um, they're certainly gonna be a lot more engaged, but the cost is high. You have, to, you have to fly people in or you have to have people stop what they're doing for the day and, and come and you know, spend, spend this, a, a, a relatively long session building those skills, right? So, while it, it gets high marks, it certainly has some challenges attached to them as well. So the next, next group I look at is your standard e-learning. And you know, e-learning comes in all shapes and sizes. Uh, and one of the things that I love is, you know, there are, especially in this DevLearn community or um, uh, in Learning Guild community, there are some amazing e-learning uh, designers. Um, so please look at this as standard versus some of that amazing stuff out there. But what I see often um, when you discount uh, all the amazing stuff that's happening is that uh, it often gets low marks, right? Um, you know, one of the great things about e-learning is it's low in cost, um, but it's also low in return on investment, in my opinion, too. Uh, you know, there, there is moderate knowledge retention. There's moderate ability to, uh, you know, apply those skills po post-training. Um, but really, it gets low marks across the board elsewhere, right? It's often not uh, application-based because that's really hard to do in an e-learning modality. Uh, it, you know, as a result, uh, people do, are not proficient in that skill. They're not confident in that skill. They're not terribly engaged. And the ROI is just low. So surprise, surprise, we've looked at classroom training. We've looked at standard learning. And now I'm going to look at game-based training. And I think it's really important to, to recognize that game-based training comes in all shapes and sizes. So much like e-learning or classroom training, you can do it well or you can do it very poorly. But when done well, it really hits high marks across the board. Uh, it, you, you, can, you can build in applic applicable skills, and we're gonna go through a lot of examples during this uh, talk. Um, you, you certainly are gonna build proficiency because you are getting your hands dirty and you are trying it. You're gonna be a lot more confident because you've mastered that skill in a virtual environment. Uh, you're gonna retain it because you're hands-on and you're doing it. You're gonna be able to apply those skills afterwards because you've already done it well here. Uh, you're gonna certainly be engaged because you're in the driver's seat. 
And ultimately, the ROI is really strong. Now, like I said, I don't believe that any uh, game should sit on its own. It needs to be part of a blended approach. But it's my belief, and, and our company's belief, that games are the jelly, if you will, in the peanut butter jelly sandwich that makes up game-based training, right? You need to have all the, all the important ingredients of your training material. That's your peanut butter. But the, the jelly is the game. The jelly is what's going to bring someone in and it's going to be truly yummy. It's going to be something that they're going to want to devour and play over and over again. They're going to want to uh, really enjoy it and they're going to remember it as a result. And when you can marry those two, it's true success. So now games come in all shapes and sizes, as I mentioned. So you want to think about what are your training and ultimately your performance objectives. You know, uh, there are lots to mention here, but of course there are lots beyond this. You know, do you want someone to be able to recall something or categorize something, visualize something, synchronize something, synthesize something, emphasize something? There's lots of more ises that I can put out there. But one of the things we start to do is think about what games lend themselves most of successfully to that performance objective. So let's go through a few. Uh, for the purposes of doing so, I suggest that we go through Bloom's taxonomy. I'm I assume that most people here are familiar with that, but you know, it's basically just thinking about different levels of human cognition and thinking about how people learn, think, understand different content. So what does that look like? There's remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Beginning with level one, right? Can a learner actually recall particular information? So we have a whole bunch of examples here that you know, are worth probably looking at. You have your traditional trivia questions. Um, you know, trivias can come with all sorts of different question types, multiple choice, multi-select, image match, text input, polling. But the things that you want to build into your trivia is not just your game questions, but are things like timers, points, streaks, leaderboards. You want to make sure that you bring that content to life with those gamification components. And we'll talk more about that momentarily. One game that I believe probably most people here have used in their training, and I think it's fantastic for remembering or recall, is Jeopardy. Jeopardy allows you to do just that, right? Uh, it allows you to uh, have a variety of questions. It has, allows you to use different types of clues, visual clues, video clues, um, audio clues, and it brings the content to life in a format that people are very comfortable with and enjoy playing. Also, something to think about is what the venue is. You know, do you want this to be in an e-learning environment? Do you want this to be in, a, in a, a virtual learning environment? Do you want this to be a single player experience? Do you want this to be a multiplayer experience? And we'll talk about that momentarily as well. So beyond that, let's look at a few other examples. Some more gamey games. So here you have a jump game, jumping from platform to platform. And you're answering questions. You're avoiding obstacles. And what's great about this and some of the other examples I'm going to show you is you can think about really taking that, that trivia-like uh, content, um, but really immersing it in a much more gamier experience. What we see is, and there are a bunch of examples like this, we see that people will come back and play over and over and over again because it's not only their you know, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation to do well in a game or to do well from a content perspective and to hopefully uh, prove themselves to be more, uh, you know, to be higher on a leaderboard and, or to potentially get the next prize than their colleagues, but also they just enjoy playing. Um, so something that's really important to think about, how do we bring joy and engagement to your learners' lives? And how do we get them to come back over and over and over again? Similar, you could take uh, a game like this, a, a match game, uh, you know, it's like Candy Crush, apply questions throughout, and you can make it certainly very specific from a thematic standpoint to your content. Level two. So with level one, the person uh, is able to recall or remember something, but who knows whether they can actually explain it. Do they really understand it enough to be able to explain it? And that's really critical. So let's look at something like uh, on the bottom left-hand corner, Wheel of Fortune, which I'm very excited to announce. Uh, as of today, uh, the game agency is going to be launching um, Wheel of Fortune in just a few months within our training arcade. More information on that to come. On the right-hand side, though, you see a, just a traditional scramble game. And what's great about something like this is you're you're requiring the person to actually spell it out. You're requiring them to um, to to say it, to spell it, and if someone can uh, really articulate it, they understand it. 
It's not necessarily they remember it, but they understand it. And that's really critical. Uh, similarly, it's not necessarily about just uh, spelling something out, but it's about being able to categorize something or put something in particular orders. So on the bottom left-hand corner, you see a, a traditional pipes game where you might want to have someone uh, say, this correlates with this. Um, and you know, do that 10 times by looking at a, a, chart, a, a game like that. Or on the right-hand side, dragging and dropping into the right category, into the right order, a sorting game. And those things are really important because it shows that the person understands it and they can articulate it. Level four, we're gonna skip over level three. Um, so with level four, can the person distinguish between different parts, right? And I think that with this, it starts to become, are they able to start to uh, analyze, right? So what I'm showing you here is a, a, a great game that's being used for a number of case studies. And this is where you're getting a lot deeper into business analysis, really looking at uh, a business case, understanding all the uh, characters or all the situations, all the um, products, all the competitors, and start to analyze, you know, what links to what? What is the root cause of this? What is affecting that? And quite honestly, this is bringing a business case to life. It's not necessarily about just being able to remember something. It's not just being able to analyze something or rather to um, articulate something, but it's about analyzing, going a step further and really getting your brain thinking about the business case and thinking about the impact of the decisions uh, of what's happening in a, in a particular situation. So there's a big dis dis um, distinction though, right? What you've done in that last game is you've analyzed something that's happened, but you're not necessarily driving the outcome. So we talked about earlier uh, using games as a choose your own adventure. This next example, which I imagine many people on this, uh, on this presentation have done themselves, is thinking about how do I take soft skills and how do I tell a story? How do I build branching uh, paths? So let's look at a, a, an industry leader, Google. They talk about how seven of the eight most important hiring skills for them or soft skills, coaching, communications, being intuitive, uh, you know, emphasizing, thinking critically, problem solving. All these are really critical when you think about uh, how to interact and be successful in a corporate environment. So let's talk about real examples where you can use these soft skills in games to, to, to have people practice those, uh, th those skills. New employee orientation, compliance and code of conduct, sexual misconduct, diversity, management interactions, customer service, call centers, sales skills, product knowledge. Let's look at some examples. And we're gonna do some videos here so you can kind of see them in play. Hi, yes, I'm Rachel. Nice to meet you, but I really don't have time to talk. If you leave your card, I'll get back to you. On the left-hand side, you see a doctor-patient interaction. On the right-hand side, you see a sales call. And what's great is in both these cases, these are branching dialogues. You were driving the decision of where this is no, going to go. No, like I just said, I don't have time. Now, what's fantastic is, is that, like I said, as a choose your own adventure, if you ultimately are able to determine where it's going to go, you're going to learn from your mistakes and you're going to learn from yeah. your successes. Okay, but we'll have to keep it short. What do you want to talk about? All right, thanks for coming in. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? You look... You look great, new hairstyle, right? Mary's day soon takes a nasty turn. Thank you. Uh, I feel terrible about this, but I have some bad news. Oh, this sounds official. Go on. Uh, your attitude has left me no alternative than to terminate your employment. Barry here, as he starts to get really upset, it's emotionally received that way, and people get really uncomfortable with me. Jackson says trainees hand sweat. Some start crying. Others take off the headset. He says that is the whole point. I'm confident. So what you're seeing here is a management training game. And I love this one because I think it is one of the most effective ones I've seen in the marketplace. Uh, it happens to be done as a virtual reality experience, but it really puts you in the seat as a manager, having to have a very difficult conversation with uh, an employee that you need to terminate. And what's fantastic about that is um, it not only is it done with a lot of emotion, but it's also done with really interesting branches. Uh, and we're going to talk about branches and how you design them because the reality is, is that they can get very complicated or they can be done uh, succinctly uh, and, and with a really strong strategy. So we'll get to that as well. You could become another person.
So this is all about diversity. What if you could become a new colleague, a peer, a manager, an employee, a stranger? What if you could experience the world from their perspective? To feel excluded, invisible, petit, powerless, silenciat, alone. What if? To increase awareness, to grow empathy, practice behavior. For a breakthrough, for an aha moment, for understanding, for inclusion, for equality, for an equal reality. <gasps> So what I love about this is the last example we showed you is you are trying to really emphasize with how someone else is feeling. And there is no better way to do that than to be in their shoes. And so this diversity training example uh, allows you to see it through their eyes and experience how they might experience it. It requires you to play as other players and truly get into their, into their mind and to experience uh, from, from their point of view. So we've talked about some soft skills. Let's talk about more technical skills, uh, whether it be clinical procedures or laboratory simulations, manufacturing and maintenance, quality assurance, safety and material handling, or certainly other dangerous work. Um, there are, by the way, some uh, videos that I've left out of this presentation, but I think that uh, worth mentioning, uh, especially today when it comes to police brutality and thinking about training, there are some really amazing examples there as well to really understand how to interact with people um, and to do it in a respectful manner and how to uh, really think about your actions before you take them. So this very first set of examples are focused on, on the left-hand side is fire safety and uh, factory training on the right-hand side. And this is about investigation. On the left-hand side, it is a how-to, step one, step two, step three, and so on. On the right-hand side, you're not just being told how to do so anymore, you're actually doing it, right? And so it's a fantastic opportunity to see in both cases, someone has to really get their hands dirty with uh, a particular situation and either uh, prevent or reduce uh, you know, fire on the left-hand side or prevent a flood on the right-hand side, understand certainly uh, you know, all the materials, all the steps, and if someone can do this successfully in a virtual world, Gosh, I hope they can do so uh, much more effectively in the real world. The unit up and look from the inside. Often you'll have dirt that, that is on the inside that may not this be visible. Next example is bringing you through uh, a digital gauge manifold right here, right? Which and is it has uh, real time going to give you a step by step of what you need to do. And you're going to get points, you're going to get feedback, you're going to get uh, scores and leaderboard status based on your performance and, and how well you're doing it. But you can see the reality is, is that this is so specific that if you can do it in the virtual world, you can apply those skills in the real world. We'll inject lidocaine around the wound to numb the area. This next example is talking about medical training, right? And that's not only how to deal with patients, but how to deal with uh, equipment as well. There's, no, there's probably no topic I would like more for someone to be masterful at uh, than, than dealing with medical procedures and uh, the body before they touch, they touch their own, right? So a really critical skill and game and game based training are fantastic venues to keep that popular. Okay, so a few things to think about when building a game. Uh, I, I believe that there are uh, six really critical items to look at. The first one on the top left-hand corner is the story arc. And what we've talked about a few times now, your choose your own adventure. Building out that story is uh, something that is really important to be done well. Um, and I believe there's a true strategy in how to do so. So you can see two charts on the left-hand side, top left-hand side. The first one is really like almost this endless uh, branching path. And that is something I encourage you not to do. Uh, the one right below it gives a, a level of branching. It allows learners to explore without uh, having them go so far uh, off into a you know, beaten path that they, there's no return, right? Uh, so the reality is, is that there's an advantage to the second chart for two, two advantages. One is from an instructional standpoint, it allows you to design something that 
feels realistic and feels uh, tangible and is not uh, so overwhelming from a, a design standpoint. But from a learner standpoint, it also continues to folk, gives them an opportunity to explore, but focuses them in the right direction. So it's really, really important. The next item is thinking about the relevancy of cho choices. You want that, that the sound to be very authentic. You want the experience to be authentic. So you can see I have circled here, throw coffee on the computer. And by all means, I bet that would never be a choice that you'd want to include in your simulation. You want to make sure that each one of the choices, and this is the case, by the way, in a simulation, in a multiple choice game, in anything, feel authentic. You, you want to make sure that they are choosing the best of the good answers, not the only good answer, right? Because otherwise, they're not really learning if they're choosing the only good answer. Number three, the number of choices. You want to make sure that it is not overwhelming. I think personally, when I'm with my family, we spend more time thinking about what we're going to watch on Netflix than actually watching it. You want to make sure that there aren't so many choices that it's overwhelming and they can't make a decision. Now, number four, realistic voice on the bottom left hand corner. Thinking about using your subject, subject matter experts and thinking about making sure that the, the voice is realistic, that is authentic, that it feels true to nature and that it's accurate, right? Because you want to make sure that whatever they are doing in your game feels as real as possible and they can apply it in the real world as a result. Number five, useful feedback. What you see here, a big wrong sign in my mind is the wrong way to give feedback. You want to make sure that it feels like a natural flow. So you want them to see the repercussions of their decisions. You don't want them just to know that they did it wrong. You want, to be able, you want them to see that if I did this in the real world, this is how I would affect other players, and this is what, this is what the uh, result would be. Uh, the last part is visuals, and visuals come in a bottom right-hand corner, come in you know, all shapes and sizes. You can go very um, minimalistic. You can go very realistic. You can go very illustrated. Uh, you can use photos, videos, and I think it's really important to think about, uh, number one, what uh, is, who is your audience? Number two, what is your culture? And number three, what is your content? Um, please, please, please do not uh, let cost uh, drive this decision. Because if you have a really well designed, and I don't mean visually, but I mean from a content perspective, a really well designed game, and you choose to save money on visuals, sometimes that can take the content from great to okay. And that's a real shame. Okay. So when you're thinking about your training, uh, I imagine that most people here are doing uh, solo play. And that is great, right? That takes, that takes somebody's uh, you know, desire to compete with themselves and be their best selves that they can be. But there are a few other ways to, you know, to build that training worth considering. So the next one is head to head, thinking about how do you build challenges that have your colleagues competing with each other and really competing for leaderboard dominance or competing for prizes, how do you up the engagement? How do you up the ante to make sure that people want to be there? And, and I think that there's, you know, that's a great way to do so. Another great thing to think about is how do you do team play? How do you get people collaborating with each other and actually nudging each other to get the best scores they can? You know, the, the reality is, is I would get beyond just solo play and make sure that you're building in a head-to-head -head and a you know, team challenge strategy into your content. Because once you do, you're going to bring it to life even more. So that brings me to gamification. Gamification, I think, is really important. Uh, you, you, everything we've talked about is building in games, right? But how do you wrap those games with a gamification strategy? And gamification, if, if you're not familiar with the term, is utilizing some of the key things of, of games, like points and competitions and rewards, and apply them to your daily activities to, to really, truly engage somebody. So let's talk about that. Um, you know, with gamification, you're going to have, like I said, on the left-hand side, competition, status, incentives, rewards. You're going to push that through someone's brain, and you're going to get released uh, dopamine. You're going to get a level of engagement, and you're going to get certainly much higher memory as a result and much more fun as a result. Um, when you think about your gamification strategy, you want to, and quite honestly, your game strategy, you want to think about your audience, though. Uh, you know, different audience members are going to have different triggers that are going to engage them. So you have your socializer who's thinking about relationships and social status, collaboration, competition. You have your free spirit, right? The, that, that person is thinking about, how do I customize stuff? How do I unlock content? How do I find different branches and go down them and really explore? How do I find little Easter eggs that I can unlock and 
be proud of myself or excited at the result. You have your achiever, right? This person's thinking about levels and quests, competition, mastery. They wanna, they wanna be the best they can be. And then last but not least, you have your philanthropist and they're focused on gifting and they're focused on social status, collaboration and purpose. And you wanna make sure that your games and more importantly, your whole gamification strategy takes into consideration these four audience types. And if you do, which you can easily do, uh, you're gonna hit a home run with your execution. Thinking further about your gamification strategy, you wanna make sure that you build out a journey of learning, right? It's not just about building one moment at a time, here's my game, I'm done, success, woohoo! But you wanna make sure that you give them a path to learn. You, you, it's a great opportunity for you to take not just a game, but take your games and your videos and your reading content and your activities and map them all together. Create little learning journeys. Think about the game of life where you're gonna have little legs, if you will. You need to complete this journey and it has these little activities involved. And the reality is, is that's not just a quick fix. That can, that can be a strategy that you build and build and build until you have a really comprehensive campaign overall. You wanna think about along the way, giving them badges and certificates, and certainly making sure that as they reach different goals, as they uh, you know, reach different achievements, they are motivated to keep going. Really, really critical. Um, and you want them to feel like along the way, there are different checkpoints where they have really been successful. You wanna make sure that uh, both, both privately, but also publicly, you are recognizing employees who are going above and beyond. You, you know, there are a lot of people who want to not just be masterful of the content, but they want to be better than all their colleagues, right? And that's where leaderboards are fantastic to make sure that you're recognizing those people um, real time in a, in a larger community. You also want to dangle a little carrot. What is going to be the thing that's going to get them excited, right? So there are all types of rewards or um, awards. So it could be gift cards, it could be pizza parties, it could be lunch with the boss, it could be a day off, it could be an advantage in the next course. It doesn't matter. Let's think about the little things that are gonna be the triggers for someone to stay engaged and excited and actively involved in your content and coming back over and over and over again. And if they do, then not only will they stick with the content, but they will digest and remember that content on a much deeper level. The last thing is thinking about data, and this is critical. Um, you know, unlike a lot of the passive training me mechanisms that we talked about, data really gives you an opportunity to, to look at, I'm sorry, games give you an opportunity to look at data on a much deeper level. Uh, you can look at, certainly, you can measure their knowledge, uh, you can look at their skill development, you can look at their application, you can certainly look at their, their decisions and track how their decision process is, you can look at the individual choices that they're making or the tendencies, their, their risk tolerance, you can track their accuracy, the effectiveness, um, the, you know, if you get into VR uh, or even so, some forms of AR, you can do uh, eye tracking um, and gestures and response time. Um, what's great about all this is, um, this not only allows you to look at the individual for what they know, but who they are and how they behave and what the persona is and how you can leverage them most effectively in your organization. The last thing that's really important is that real time, you can coach them along the way. You can do that with artificial intelligence. You can do that real time uh, in, 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 in coaching them as well. Um, uh, but you know, one of the things that we hear though, and I'm just looking at my, uh, the, the chat is talking about, uh, is, is, are, is there a risk of someone spending too much time on games? Um, and, and I think it's really important to think about, uh, games are, and certainly training games are fun, they're effective, uh, and the reality is we see on average, um, our games that we build, uh, have people coming back three to six times uh, uh, to play. It kind of depends on what type of game it is. Um, and, and the reality is, is that some of those games are three, four, five minutes. Some of them are 20 minutes. But you're not going to most likely build something that's going to have someone spending, you know, hours or days or months and not be focused on their day-to-day -day work. Um, you know, the reality is if you think about someone coming three to six times, times three minutes or 20 minutes, uh, it's time well spent because they are gonna learn that content on a much deeper level and they're gonna be able to apply that content much, much more effectively um, uh, in the workforce. So the last thing I wanna talk about is how do you bring it all together? So let's look at this. This is how, you know, taking your games, thinking about your gamification strategy.
they have them to play games, they also start to challenge each other. Um, to their replay games, see their scores, see their achievements. One of the things I think is important is not just you challenge me from top down, but having people challenge their peers. Make sure that uh, they are able to actually truly uh, feel a level of accomplishment, feel a level of bragging, feel a level of collaboration, competition. Also feel a level of customization. Whether they are picking from pre-existing avatars or building their own, you want to make sure that people feel like they can uh, really, they're in the driver's seat. Making sure they feel like it's their uh, experience that they can enjoy. So uh, this is all from the Training Arcade uh, at the Game Agency's platform. Uh, this, what you just saw, is arcades. It includes a bunch of uh, games as well as a bunch of gamification uh, mechanics. As I mentioned earlier, very excited to announce that as of today, we will be launching uh, in uh, early January, Wheel of Fortune as our 10th game. Um, but let's just do a quick review of what we did. As Steve Urkel said, did I do that? I hope I did. Um, we talked about the 2020 office and classroom. We talked about the benefits of game-based training. We talked about how to identify the right game for your objective and make sure that you're mapping it appropriately to your content. Um, making sure that we uh, map in not only an individual game, you want it to be a whole learning journey. So how do you build a gamification strategy that um, brings everything together? And then last thing is how to measure success. And that's really critical. It's not just about being fun, but it's about you looking at the data and making sure that it's actionable and that you can apply that knowledge of what people know, how people behave, uh, what, how people perform, and make sure that they can perform all that better in the workforce. Uh, so I want to thank you for attending uh, this talk. By all means, here's my contact information. Happy to answer any other questions, um, either via chat later today, uh, or rather over the, over the course of DevLearn, um, or certainly at a later date. But thank you very much for attending. Appreciate it.